I have four young friends that I've asked to join me. So you guys come on up. Please give them a nice round of applause as they come. Yeah, all right. So we have Max and Emily and Nate and Julia. Good morning. Good morning. Say it louder. There we go. All right. Boys and girls, I have a question I want to ask you today. What is a fairy tale? Nate. Um, it's like a fake story. A fake story. Okay. What were you going to say, Emily? A story that can't happen in real life. A story that can't happen in real life. I like that. How about you, Max? It's like fiction. It's fiction. That's a big word for a guy like 10 years old. That's pretty much isn't is it? It's a it's a story that is make believe. It's fiction. It's not really true. Can you like think of some examples of a fairy tale? Nate. The three little kittens. The three little kittens. Sounds like a good one. Emily. The three little pigs. The three little pigs. How about the three little frogs? That's not what you were gonna say. What were you gonna say, Julia? Little Red Riding Hood? Hmm? You were going to say that. So yeah, those are good examples of, of fairy tales. Now, let me ask you this. Do fairy tales, even though they're made up and fiction, do they have a lesson? Do they teach anything, do you think? Or is it just a story? What do you think, Max? Sometimes. Sometimes. That'd be, that's a good answer. Nate? It's just a story. How about you, Emily? So you were going to say sometimes too. Where are you going to weigh in, Julia? You think it has a lesson? How about this? You guys know Pinocchio? Okay, you see a picture of Pinocchio right now? Is he up there? What is up with that guy's nose? Julia? A cricket. A cricket. <laughs> Ask a question, get an answer. A cricket's on the end of his nose, but how did Pinocchio get a nose that long? You want to all say it together? He did what? He lied. He lied. So that tells me that maybe fairy tales sometimes do, even though they're made up, teach a lesson. Pinocchio, the lesson would be, don't lie or your nose is going to get really long. And your noses look nice to me, so you must not lie too much. <laughs> Would you like to make... I, I think we should make up a fairy tale ourselves. I think we should just make one up. Should we? So how do fairy tales, most of them, start? Once upon a time, there was a brother and a sister whose names were, we're making it up, Grace, Grace and, Greg. and who, Greg. and Greg, Grace and Greg, and every Saturday, Grace and Greg love to go to the park? zoo, park, zoo park. Zoo park. So this Saturday, when they got to the zoo park and walked in, immediately they saw this huge skateboard. Skateboard. With a lion on it. Skateboard what? With a lion on it. A skateboard with a lion on it. Yeah. And, yeah, that's a normal thing that you'd see at a zoo park. So... So the, the, the lion on the skateboard, the lion's name, first of all, was Leo. Leo, yeah. And Leo, now the thing about most lions is most lions, the color of a lion is, for most lions, it is yellow, yeah, yeah, brown. But Leo, the lion on the skateboard, he was unlike any other lion. His color was 
purple. With blue polka dots. With blue polka dots, exactly. <laughs> this is getting really, really good. So, as Grace and Greg were, were walking through the zoo park, they saw Leo, the purple lion with blue polka dots, going down on the skateboard, and suddenly something unusual happened. Everything disappeared right after he crashed into a bear. Now, were Grace and Greg, did they disappear too, or were they still there? They were still there, but everything else was completely gone, right? And they lived happily ever after. Wow, that is amazing. Now, boys and girls, what is the story of the purple, blue polka dotted Leo the lion on a skateboard in a zoo park teach us? Never Nate. Be careful. Be careful. <laughs> Never to ride a skateboard with a lion on it. Any other like lessons from this amazing fairy tale that we just made up? Don't go to a zoo park. Don't go to a zoo park. Just go to the zoo. Yeah. The zoo parks are zoo parks are dangerous or the park. All right. <laughs> Boys and girls, maybe there isn't a big lesson with the story we just made up. But you are about to see and hear a story. It looks a little bit like it could be a fairy tale, but it is not. It is true. It's the story of new, and actually, it's the story of you. Let's watch. Once there was someone, that someone is new. I think that new someone wants to know you. That someone with you has taught something true. That someone with you has taught virtue. As time went on, in lieu of virtue, the asker of questions one day came to you. Could someone you trust present such review? The truth you've been taught perhaps was untrue. In turmoil and stress, new worries came to could what I've been taught have been misconstrued? So much to think over, you start to unglue. From the cares of the day, you hid and withdrew. Now then, someone you knew who loved and cared too, that one came searching. Oh you, where are you? Frightened and worried, you remembered once then, the asker of questions came by once again. I made this one fall. His debt is now due. The asker of questions stakes his claim on you. The battle for you is now a pursue. The battle for you turns now a rescue. I am who I am, and I see the view, says the one who loves and cares for you too. To the asker of questions, I see through you. I am will respond and stake my claim too. This one's mine, and my word is true. And looking your way, I am says to you, I will stand in your place and make all things new. Your price is now paid, the debt no more due, and new is the life that now lives in you. is the life that now lives in you. This is the story of new. It is no fairy tale. It is not fiction. It is not fake. It is as true as true gets. It is as new as new can be. Would you pray with me? 
Heavenly Father, we confess to you that there are things that are old, tired, beat up. They feel sometimes like death itself. And we need new. We understand, Lord Jesus Christ, that this is a day when you would declare to us, I will make all things new. And God, I'm asking that you would do that in me and in each of my friends that is in this place. Holy Spirit, open our hearts to hear what you want to speak to us. And Lord, in this place, somehow, would you help each one of us somehow block out the fact that there are a whole bunch of people around us and listen as though this is a message just for us. Do you work in us, God, as we pray it and thank you in advance for what it is that you will do. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. We love stories. We love romantic stories. We love action stories. We love human interest stories. We love underdog stories. We love stories and and maybe that's because right from the beginning, our parents told us stories as soon as we were old enough, or we, when we had children, as soon as our kids were able to uh, focus their eyeballs on a book and sit in our lap long enough, we would read them stories. Remember what some of those stories were? I, you know, you'd get that big, huge book, you'd buy that big book, the big clock book. Open up the cover, the big clock. Page one. Page two. The big clock goes tick. Page three. The big clock goes tick tock. Page four. The end. $15.95. And we buy that book and we buy other books because. Our kids love stories. My kids love stories. I don't have little kids anymore. Now I've got grandkids. And my son and daughter-in-law have actually figured out, yeah, shameless, I know. Uh, they've actually figured out that the best discipline in their home is not the timeout chair or even a spanking. It is the threat that you're not going to hear your bedtime stories tonight. And uh, having little kids again, grandkids, has reintroduced my wife and I to these little kid stories, these, um, you know, nursery rhymes. And every time I read one, I'm thinking to myself, well, where do these authors come from? The words that they write, I mean, what are they smoking? They just don't make sense sometimes. And not just the new ones, the ones that go way back, like uh, Georgie Porgy. Pudding and pie. Kissed the girls and made them cry. When the boys came out to play, Georgie Porgy ran away. What is up with that? I mean, George, I think Georgie Porgy's got issues. He's making girls cry, kissing them, and when the boys come to play, he runs away. What is up? He's got, he needs a counselor, I think. Or how about this one? Little Tommy Tucker sings for his supper which is a bit in and itself unusual, but let's go there. What shall we give him? Brown bread and butter. How shall he cut it without a knife? How will he be married without a wife? It's like little Tommy Tucker. What are we doing talking about marriage? I mean, seriously? But probably my favorite in terms of a Kid's story that makes absolutely no sense whatsoever is this one. Goosey, goosey, gander, where shall I wander? First of all, that's just a bad rhyme. <laughs> Except if the guy that wrote it was British, then it works. Goosey, goosey, gander, where shall I wander? <laughs> Upstairs and downstairs and in my lady's chamber, 
There I met an old man, which begs the question, what is he doing? But there I met an old man who would not say his prayers. I took him by the left leg and threw him down the stairs. <laughs> Makes total sense to me. But we love our stories, don't we? We love... We love the romantic stories, and action stories, and we love the underdog stories. It's why we like Rocky. It's why we like Rudy, or maybe even Cinderella. And in the last few years, now with the emergence of social media, we have this new phenomenon called what's trending now. What's trending now on Twitter? What's trending now on Facebook? What's trending now on Google? What's trending now on Yahoo? What's trending now at the CenturyLink on Easter Sunday morning? What's right? Well, the top stories. You know, we, love, we, we are addicted to stories. We can't get enough. We, we got to know what's the top story. So did you see this a couple of a weeks ago, this, this bowl? Uh, yeah, there it is. Uh, a family from New York purchased that bowl at a garage sale in 2007 for $3. It sat on the mantle in their living room until someone happened to see it and thought, you know, you ought to check that bowl out. I think there's something to it. So they did and found out that this bowl was made over a thousand years ago in China, which makes it a piece of China. Yes. <laughs> Sorry. I thought that would go over better, but... and sold at an auction for $2.2 million. Now that's the story. Or how about, did you see this one just last week? Uh, Pedro Poizada, uh, winner of $338 million in the lottery. Or how about what's trending now? Kim Kardashian and her maternity clothes. I mean, come on, people, you got to get with this. This is what's going on. This is a top story, all right? Okay, with all that said, a little dose of reality. Probably the odds are very long on any one of us, though there are many, ever being part of a $2.2 million story or a $338 million story. Probably you and I will not end up on any sort of what's trending now top 10 list. However, my friend, the joy of Easter morning for me is to declare to you today that you are indeed, from God's point of view, on center stage in the story of new. It is actually the story of you. Some of you know this, but some of you may not. So allow me to attempt to tell you how you are at center stage in the story of New. In the beginning was nothing but God. And God, out of nothing, made the world and everything in it. And on the sixth day of creation, God made Adam and Eve, husband and wife, brought them to one another, said, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. It was perfect. It was fantastic. It was paradise. No tears, no sadness, no pain, no strife, no conflict, no sickness, no nothing, just everything that is, until the day the asker of questions came along and planted the seed of doubt in the mind of Adam and Eve over what they had heard God tell them. They, unlike God, who could see right through the asker of questions, fell for the lie and sinned. And in the moment that that happened, everything from man's perspective became destroyed and ruined. 
With sin came sadness and pain and heartache and the breaking of relationships, jealousy, selfishness, hatred, death, and worst of all of it, it separated man from his creator, her creator. Adam and Eve realized as soon as they had disobeyed that something was terribly, terribly wrong. So when God came looking for them and asked, where are you? They were hiding, filled with guilt and shame and fear and confusion. But in that moment, even though the crown of his creation had decided to listen to the asker of questions, Satan, the devil, the enemy, more than they would listen to him. Even in the heartbreak of that moment, God looked at them with compassion and love. The same way he continues to look at his people and lost people, people that are afraid and confused and filled with shame and guilt. God looked at them in the same way. And he said, I am going to send your rescuer. And God chose people and he chose leaders and he would choose men and women who would stand up and utter the word of the Lord. And just as Adam and Eve should have never doubted the word of the Lord in the beginning, these prophets would stand up and they would declare and they would prophesy a Savior is coming. This is what you need to look for. A virgin, Isaiah says, will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. Micah foretold that when this, were to, when, when this was to happen, it would happen in a know-nothing place called Bethlehem. Zechariah declared that this young boy would grow to be a man and a king and one day would ride into the holy city of Jerusalem on the back of a donkey. And Isaiah would tell us that this king who would ride into Jerusalem would end up on Friday executed on a Roman cross where he would take our infirmity, carry our sorrow, be pierced for our transgressions, and be crushed with our iniquities. And it all happened as God's word had spoken, every bit of it. It was all part of the script that God would write into the story of new. And Jesus, the Savior and King, the Conqueror, the Mighty Rescuer would come and he would climb a hill and he would end up on that cross on that hill called Golgotha and there he would give his lifeblood for the sins of Adam and Eve and the sins of you and me and all people everywhere in any time. And today we thank God that this last chapter in the story of New did not end on Friday. If it would have ended on Friday, there would be no reason for us to be here today. But I want to say with that great old preacher, and I know you do too, it's Friday. But Sunday's coming. You want to say it? It's Friday, but... Come on, you want to say it or do you want to say it? You pretend like you're a preacher right now. It's Friday, but Sunday is coming. Come on, Sunday has come. And because Sunday has come, because the resurrection is something that we are celebrating today, I declare to you that the story is of our hero who came out of the grave, who stared down death and sin and Satan has risen. He is risen indeed. And he would declare, he would declare to us today, this is not the story of darkness, but the story of light. This is not the story of tears, but the story of laughter. Yours is not the story of doom and despair, but the story of hope. Yours is not the story of death, but of life. It is not the story of old. It's the story of new. And the accuser, the asker of questions, would try to come to you and make you doubt the word of Almighty God. And when you do, old comes, 
and death comes and pain comes. But the Word of God is true and it is trustworthy. And I want to say you can take it to the bank, but better said, the bank comes to you. Because all of the riches of God, all of the riches of God, far more valuable than a $2.2 million bowl or a $338 million lottery ticket, all the riches of God are yours for now and in eternity and those things will fade away and those things will turn to ash but the word of the Lord endures forever. And the word of the Lord says in Revelation chapter 21 words written by the Apostle John who perhaps some 60 or 70 years earlier had been at the foot of the cross with Jesus' mother Mary, and now an old man, is given a vision of heaven and told, write it down. And this is what he wrote. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, now the dwelling of God is with men, and he will live with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. And he who is seated on the throne said, I, say it with me, I am making everything new. Then he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. Is anybody realizing in this moment that some 2,000 years ago, because John listened to the Lord and wrote it down, that we are reading it? Has that dawned on anyone? Are you seeing that 2,000 years ago, Jesus wanted the beloved disciple to write this down, not so that John would have it in his diary, he was about to die so that you and I would know the truth. The asker of questions now receives a new name. His new name is receiver of bad news because Jesus Christ has defeated him and sin and death and all of this thing that makes us feel so old. So you, dear friend, are the one that Jesus, the great I am, would fight for. You are the one that he, the personification of new, would stake his claim on. Watch it again. I am who I am, and I see the view, says the one who loves and cares for you too. To the asker of questions, I see through you. I am will respond and stake my claim too. This one's mine, and my word is true. And looking your way, I am says to you, I will stand in your place and make all things new. Your price is now paid, the debt no more due, and new is the life that now lives in you.
knew is the life that now would live in you, but some of you might be saying this morning, then why don't I feel that way? Why is what I feel, why does it feel old? Old as in beat up, weary, worn out, tired, same old, same old. Why is it that way? It is that way because we live in Adam and Eve's world. We live in a world that is broken and fallen. We live in a world that still bears the consequences of sin in this life. It's just what happens. Most of the old, most of the tired, most of the beat up, most of the dead stuff in my life, I cause. I bring most of my own problems on with my own selfishness and with my own sin. And then to make matters worse, every now and then someone heaps that on top of me and hurts me and vice versa. We do it to each other. This is the effect of living in Adam and Eve's world in a broken and fallen world. But this is the message of Easter. You cannot pull yourself out of old. You can't work so hard or do a certain number of things in order to extricate yourself from that which is old and dead and tired. But the reality of Easter is that you had someone come and stand in your place and stake his claim on you to say, this one's mine. Adam and Eve got into trouble when they doubted the word of God. It's the same thing for us today. The word of God is true and trustworthy. There is no better proof of that than the resurrection of Jesus. Because if Jesus could say, of his body, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up again and pull that off, then every word of God that is spoken is true. Just check out the true and trustworthy word of God according to the scripture. Jesus says, with me, you get a new song, you get new things, you get a new name, you get a new covenant, you get new mercies, you get a new spirit, you get a new heart, you're a new creation. You get a new attitude, a new way, a new birth, a new life. And how do you get this? Surely it must cost millions. It doesn't cost you anything. It cost Jesus Christ his life. But it's a free gift for you. And how is it that that gift comes to you? It goes right back to the garden. You want life? Trust the word of the Lord. You want death? Let the asker of questions cause doubt in your mind to think that God and what he says to you isn't relevant. You want old? Listen to that accuser. You want new? Trust the word of God. Easter is the revelation and proof that we can. When you leave today, each of you, each home, <coughs> will receive a packet of seeds. Black-eyed Susan. And the idea is that you'll go home, <clears throat> perhaps even this afternoon, and plant these in your front yard or your backyard. And in time, you'll see them sprout and grow and blossom. And it'll be a visual reminder that God is always making things new. But I have a feeling in my heart and mind today that the planting that God would want you to do is already happening. I believe that today, 
as you've been here, at some point, God began to plant something new in you. Maybe you came with something old and you feel, I think, I believe God's going to give me something new. If that's true for you, if there's something that God is speaking to you today about something old and beat up and weary and tired in your life, in just a moment, I'm going to ask and give you an invitation to do physically what's happening in you spiritually. Because I believe that the Lord would, would have you respond to this great gift of Easter. And perhaps, as God is doing that in your life, in just a moment, the band worship team is going to come back and we're going to sing a song. And as that happens, I'm going to invite you to just get up from wherever it is that you are. And I want you to come down around the stage, here in the front, on the main floor. Because I want to pray for you. And I believe God wants to do something brand new in your life. Now, if you know... This is already something that God is doing in your life. Just get up right now and start making your way to the front. Let's all stand. Let's begin to pray. I'd like to ask the intercessors to come forward. And I'm asking any of you who are ready for God to do something new in your life, start walking forward. He's doing something inside of you. Spiritually, exercise it out by coming physically to the front. And if you don't know who I'm talking to, maybe I can just describe it this way. Are there some of you here today that are in a relationship that is broken and it feels old and it feels dead and it feels tired and you want God to bring something new into it? It's you that I'm talking about, come down. Come all the way to the front, just surround the stage to my right and to my left and in the front. Because I wanna pray for you today. This is a brand new day. This is the best day. It's the first day of the rest of a very new life for you. Or maybe you're here today and you've been fighting this nasty habit or sin or addiction. It's got you in its grasp and you're done. You want, you're ready to be done with it. You need to break free. You need to break loose. If that's you, come down. Maybe you're hurting you're sick. Maybe somebody here today is fighting cancer and you're asking, God, would you do a miracle in me? If that's you, come down. I want to pray for God to do a miracle, a brand new thing in your life. Just come. Wherever it is that you are, even if you're all the way on the top, <clears throat> just come down. I'm going to wait for you. Maybe you used to walk with God in a relationship that was on fire. It's like you were so close. And you realize today that it's not God that left, it's you kind of drifted away. And you want that again. You want that new life. You want that fire, that first love. You want it back. Come down. Crowd in here, people, so that there's room. Just move on up to the front, please. Maybe you're here today and you hurt somebody badly, and you know it, and because of it, you've got guilt and you've got shame. And in fact, you are so down on yourself that you say things about yourself that aren't true. You say things about yourself. You say you're a loser. You say you're not worth it. You look at your life as though it's not valuable. You said, how could anybody love me? That's just, the asker of questions bringing doubt. God loves you. If this is you, come forward. In a way, I feel like we should all be coming forward right now. Who of us doesn't fit these categories? Or maybe you've been hurt. You've been hurt really bad. And you're just dealing with resentment and bitterness and anger. You've been hurt so bad, you hate that person who hurt you. And what you don't even realize is happening is it was bad enough that they did that horrible thing to you. What you don't realize is that you're hurting yourself even more by hating them. And you've got to get over that. You've got to get past it. If that's you, come. Maybe 
you've never known new. Maybe you've never known Jesus. Maybe you've always doubted God's word. And today, you are realizing that the only thing you get when you doubt God is old and death. And you're done with that. And you want to receive Jesus in your life. Maybe you've never been baptized and you want to be baptized. And you want to, you want to say, Jesus, I can't do this anymore. I need you to do this for me. If that's you, especially you, just come forward. And I'm going to pray. I'm going to pray for all of you that are coming. And don't stop coming. If you are, we're going to sing a song now. It's a song about the fact that God brings us blessing. There are more than 10,000 blessings. There are more than 10,000 reasons. And those of you that are already here, don't leave. Just stand right here and sing the song. And those of you that when we're singing, you still know that God wants you to come forward. Just make your way down here. Folks, crowd on even a little bit more so we can make room. We're all one big family, all in the same situation today. So don't be afraid of each other. All right? So we're going to sing this song, and after the song, I'm going to pray for you. Also, just so that you know, some of the people that are in this group, they've got little tags on that say, I pray. These are people from our church that have been taught and trained how to love you and show compassion to you and pray for you. So even when we're all done today and after I've prayed a general prayer for you, you might just turn around and say, I need specific prayer. Just look for one of those people that have the I pray tag on their shirt and let them pray for you. Keep coming if God's telling you to come. Don't anybody go, this is a holy moment. It's a sacred moment. And let's, let's, just, let's just take it all in now. Jesus. Jesus. We desperately need you. We repent of how we've doubted your word, God. And that's brought us old, beat up, and tired, and worn out, and death. We need new, God. We need you, Jesus. So hear our prayer and now hear our song. Hear the joyful noise we raise to you. Surely there are 10,000 reasons and more to give you praise. Let's sing at the top of our lungs if, it, if it's required. Let's, let's let our hearts engage in the song. Sing it like we've not sung a song yet today. Shall we, let's just say, Lord, come, even as we sing. Inhabit the praises of your people. We pray in Jesus' name.